Um, welcome today uh, to this session. It's our session on the uh, power of gene editing, the implications for a future of, of medicine. Uh, so we've got uh, a very short presentation uh, that I'm going to go through on on some of my thoughts on you know just sort of an overview of, on on where where things are, um, uh, and then we'll move then into. Uh, work done by Thomas Waka's lab um, at Baylor, and uh, then we'll talk with uh, Jan Noltes, we'll talk from, uh, um, from UC um, uh, Davi Davis, and then Colin Bishop from, from Wake Forest. So we've got a, a good uh, breadth of knowledge in this area that uh, we're gonna cover today. Uh, it is gonna be interactive, so we really want your your questions and comments and and so that we can all all really learn from each other so uh, it will we'll get started here so uh, I think the real key question in in front of many of us today in the regenerative medicine area uh, drug development side uh, the whole area of of uh, stem cell therapy is is how do we get to to clinical trials uh, most quickly a and through um, compound development to preclinical testing to the IND and, and so forth. So I really foresee the the future of, of gene editing is is one really trying to be uh, getting us there more quickly. So can we develop better models, better representation of disease uh, models with uh, gene editing? Uh, and then uh, the other side of things I think is uh, obviously the, the hope that in, in the future that we can correct uh, certain diseases um, with gene editing practices. And along with that comes a whole set of ethical questions about uh, gene editing and, and the ability to, and should we be doing this, uh, somatic cells or, or in the germline uh, as well. So I, I just throw up um, a, a set of examples here, a couple of different areas. Um, there's been some work, uh, a lot of work in gene editing uh, over the last couple of years and it's, it's just exploded. So. Uh, example of, of correcting a, a gene mutation is uh, a number of those are out there today and, and a lot of work is, is going on in that area. Uh, and in addition, there's, there's lots of work uh, uh, in developing better models and, and can you develop a, a cardiac uh, chip model with using induced pluripotent stem cells uh, with, uh, say, a mitochondrial defect or so forth. So uh, a lot of published work uh, in, in the last couple of years, a lot of good work that, that's going out on out there. Uh, this session, these sessions are meant to be uh, uh, really general. Uh, we're not supposed to get into depth in, in any uh, great detail with our research. Uh, but so in order just to get people up to speed, I've, I've taken this slide uh, from uh, our collaborators at Transposigen. Um, they have a, a whole suite of, of different ways of gene editing. Um, by far, they're not the only people out there. There's a lot of different groups uh, offering different uh, uh, gene editing technologies uh, from Talons to CRISPRs to next, next generation uh, systems that are, that are going on out there. So, one of the questions that I'll pose to the, the uh, speakers today is, you know, how, how can we most effectively get this technology moving forward? What's the, what's the cheapest, what's the fastest, what's the most reliable systems out there um, going forward? And, and then um, beyond that, what are the, some of the easiest uh, gene modifications? Uh, whether it's in this case a gene knockout or a gene addition. Uh, type of uh, technology. Uh, and uh, we'll get into some of that hopefully in the discussion part as well. Uh, certainly there, there's a lot of interest in different, uh, gene editing has been around for some time. Uh, some people have called it gene targeting in the past. Uh, 
Um, so there's from homologous recombination to Cree Lox uh, co recombination, uh, recombinase uh, type of technology. So there's, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to a number of different uh, technologies out there. And hopefully we can discuss some of those as well. Uh, for instance, the Cree Lock system is, is uh, thought to have, uh, you know, le less flexibility than some of the CRISPR and Talons technology and, and less mutagenic than uh, some of these new um, generation gene editing technologies. So uh, something uh, further to discuss uh, during the presentations as well. Uh, I think it's also, I am alluded to this previously, is the choice of cells. Are we going to be doing this uh, type of gene editing in, in uh, uh, stem cells and proliferative stem cells and differentiated cells? Are we starting to work with uh, more differentiated cells or progenitor cells for that are maybe tissue specific? Uh, and, and then eventually, can we be doing this uh, uh, efficiently in, in tissues and, and possibly whole, whole organisms as well. So those are, those are some of the areas that we need to think about as well. Our own um, interests have been in gene editing is, is how to use some of our cells going forward and how we will be able to use gene editing in stem cells. Traditionally, most people think about gene modifications in the pluripotent stem cell state, uh, then uh, selecting and expanding these, and then for differentiation in a 3D culture system or adherent culture system, and then for our interest in the uh, neural cells, and a full disclosure here is that we're interested in this from a, a company side as well, Aruna Biomedical is a group that I work with as well. So uh, one of the things that we're interested in is, again, to use uh, it in, in non-pluripotent uh, stem cells uh, so that we could possibly save, save time in using them in, uh, in progenitor cell lines. Uh, we avoid some of the complications. If you're looking in particularly uh, neural lineage uh, applications, uh, therefore eliminating the uh, non-neural contamination side of things and the non-uniform differentiation process. And uh, the potential that uh, um, being able to, to do it in a stem cell based system is that we have uh, scalability in that and, and uh, consistencies and uh, all the advantages of doing that in, in the uh, stem cell side of things or in the uh, progenitor state. So um, we, we've been doing some work, as I said, with transposigen and, and trying to genetically engineer neural progenitor cells here. Um, and we've added uh, um, a piggyback system that is amenable to gene engineering. Um, and uh, we've been able to clonally isolate these cells and select for uh, particular genes of interest and then differentiate those into differentiated neurons. So that uh, really is just to give you a flavor of, of some of the things that, uh, that are going on. Uh, interests in this area are widespread and uh, I look forward to uh, uh, the rest of the panel uh, giving some thoughts and then we'll move right into discussion and, and questions. So Thomas, can you come on up and, and get started with your so I'm Thomas Waka and I'm um, at the Black Family Stem Cell Institute in, uh, at Mount Sinai in New York. I moved, <laughs> I moved three years ago um, and I wanted to uh, um, give an, um, um, an, you an idea of where the field currently is. We are not really developing gene editing techniques actively. We are more now on the user side, but uh, by uh, telling you one particular story, I hope I will be able to illustrate a bit how much has changed over the last perhaps 10 years or so. So I started my postdoc um, in, in 2001 in Jamie Thompson's lab and, and the major project was actually to do gene targeting in human embryonic stem cells. And, and we, um, 
we basically modeled a protocol that was used for a number of years in the mouse, which is a classical gene targeting replacement vector. So you have long homology arms on both sides and you um, have the, the piece in the middle that is then replaced where you have, uh, for example, a selection cassette put in. And so um, this project, and, and I specifically the idea was to target OCT4, um, with, with GFP to create both a reporter cell line as well as a cell line that can be selected for when the cells express OCT4. And Jamie was at that time very particular actually about the selection cassette because um, he thought maybe in the future one day we will be able to um, take transcription factors and overexpress them and when we select for OCT4 can actually reprogram into embryonic stem cell-like cells. Uh, and and um, I think this speaks also to, to the vision Jamie had already in the 90s, not only to develop stem cells as a technology, but also thinking really, in my opinion, years and years ahead of where the field then uh, ended up in 2006. So um, back to the gene targeting, it took me um, over a year to create the targeting vector, to clone the targeting vector, and uh, roughly another year to do the gene targeting in human embryonic stem cells. So two years for, for, for a single gene. Um, and uh, now, now fast forward uh, um, to 2010. I, I was um, at that time at Baylor and we had a project to knock out a particular gene. We're interested in Ronin and we wanted to do this in human embryonic stem cells. And uh, learning from the experience I had, but also what, what uh, uh, the other fact that no, none of the postdocs really wanted to do this with classical gene targeting, we turned to a technology that was uh, very new at that time, which was zinc finger mediated gene targeting. The idea that you essentially do the same thing, but you help yourselves by introducing a double stranded uh, uh, break in the DNA in a site specific fashion. So this, um, this had a number of uh, advantages, the targeting vector, uh, was much simpler, so it was a lot easier to clone. The homology arms were much shorter. Um, the downside was uh, the zinc fingers needed to be to be developed by a company. In th this case, it was Sigma, and they offered this as a service. It took roughly three or four months to create the zinc fingers, and uh, for each zinc finger, twenty-five thousand yeah. dollar. And and so, um, while it was more convenient and faster. It, it was actually also pretty expensive, I think, and ultimately it took us roughly six months to do the knockout, but it was successful. Um, and, and so when, when I was asked last week, can you um, help also with this session here? Um, I, I walked into the lab and, and just randomly picked two postdocs and, and told them to prepare slides about uh, their current work on CRISPR. And, and this just tells you, I think right now in, in a regular modern uh, state-of-the-art research lab, everyone is doing CRISPR, at least uh, at, at the school I am at. And, and um, it just, in, in my opinion, changed everything. So I will not really tell you a lot about uh, how it works, um, but I want to point you to, um, um, to a New Yorker article that appeared uh, a couple of weeks ago that tells you everything, not only the science, which we all know about, but, but also the background about the person or, or the two people involved in this. It's a fascinating story in case you're interested. So, so what are the targeting projects we were doing? Um, the first one was a mutation in, in, in a TNF-alpha receptor gene called EDA. We wanted to create a gain of function mutation, V370A mutation, that has been found in humans to cause um, uh, a particular disease. Uh, hypohydrotic ectodermal dysplasia, HED. So we wanted to, to introduce this mutation into ES cells. And so the way how you do this is you have to design these guide RNAs. Uh, this is all very standardized and extremely straightforward and takes you essentially a day. When, when you, w once you have them, uh, you see here we not only wanted to, because it's uh, so efficient, not only make the mutation, but also quickly add a stop code and to create a null mutation so we immediately created a number of guide RNAs for, for this gene targeting experiment. And, and here's the targeting scheme, again the same thing, you have a replacement vector with short homology arms, the guide RNA and the CRISPR that is doing the cut. Um, and this is, this is how it looked, uh, the, the experiment. Um, it was incredibly efficient. You see here um, um, that the, the, the targeting frequency heterozygous was roughly 50%. 
and, and homozygous uh, uh, gene targeting effects were, were 5%, roughly 5%. So, so, from, uh, so this experiment took us uh, roughly a month to, to do, yeah, and with, with uh, both a knockout as well as a uh, mutation, a disease-specific mutation. Okay, and, and the second example, so, so this is all here verified when the, the mutation was really introduced, etc. is something we are doing right now, and it worked immediately, and this is creating a bunch of mutations in, in P53 in disease-specific alleles. And, um, um, and again, this is um, basically a four to six week project and, and requires essentially no cost once you have the vectors and, and the guide RNA, there's no no additional thing you need to do. So, so that's where, where currently things stand, I think, in the lab. I hope this, uh, this will trigger some discussion. Thank you. How are they trained in this technology? Um, so I don't know. They suddenly came into the lab uh, <laughs> during this. And, and I think that's also the beauty of this. They, um, it's just so simple. There are workshop, I, I, workshops that are organized uh, everywhere with different companies involved and, and so on, but we didn't really talk about this. It was suddenly coming to me with, um, with you know, me wanting to, to do these knockouts and, and then them coming and um, saying, I will CRISPR this, and that became jargon, really, CRISPRing things. Yes? Can you let me see if we can get a mic? Are the knockouts being used? Yeah. So, so it, uh, the question is if this is for, for therapy or, or what QC do we do then and, and other things, very relevant, of course. Uh, this is purely experimental and, and so, so the question is, of course, about off-target effects. Uh, do we introduce other mutations because we essentially um, transfect an, uh, nuclease in, into cells, right? And then um, from my perspective, it, it just works and if you have the right controls for, from a basic research perspective, it doesn't matter so much. Uh, one would have to dig a bit deeper into this if one wants to um, um, find out if there are other off-target effects, etc. It was just from the Zeng Lab, uh, just last week or this week, a sci science paper where they created a tamed version of, of, uh, of the enzyme that, that seems to be um, um, uh, even more specific, but, but the, again, it's not my research area and it's just from a basic science perspective where I can say having the right controls, you don't have to probably worry so much about off-target effects. So, so you just say, go ahead and CRISPR it, but does anybody come back and say, well, it'd be easier to do it with talents these days or there's obviously not zinc fingers, uh, but uh, Oh, and do they say, oh, I can't do this ever? Is this going to be di Again, possible to do? I, I don't know. I wouldn't have. Um, it's probably possible, but this is what they come back with, right? And they talk to each other, and, and they, everyone reads it in, in papers. And, and I, I think this would just beat everything in terms of efficiency and simplicity, right? I, I think it's pretty clear already, yeah. Any other specific questions for Thomas? Yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. For off-target effects, is, is I know the celery nuclease or something assay was being used for a while. Is that still, like, in terms of actually analyzing the results for right. off-target? Right. There, there are some, some uh, QC things, and even the design sort of predicts off-target effects, but, but, but again, that's not my area of expertise. I can't tell you. Okay, so we work on uh, stem cell gene therapy, and we are using uh, stem cells to deliver the gene editing platforms. So I think that's why I'm here. It's kind of a different um, take on things. So we have several um, therapeutic stem cell gene therapy options. The most um, well known is adding a normal gene copy to restore function. Uh, hematopoietic stem cells are currently best for that long-term therapy. We can do cell replacement strategies now, so transplantation of healthy progenitors or stem cells. And here we most um, often think of the gene-modified uh, patient-induced uh, pluripotent stem cell-derived um, end, end cells, uh, hepatocytes and neurons. And this is where the, the CRISPRs and the gene editing will be used um, a lot in, um, in the cell therapy platform. 
uh, cells are used for tissue healing, promoting angiogenesis and neurogenesis. So mesenchymal stem cells that I've worked with for 30 years are very good at that. Uh, just on their own, they secrete factors that promote healing over inflammation and scarring, and they're easily gene modified. And then using those cells, um, using MSCs to carry the cargo, um, for silencing or gene editing for a dominant mutant allele, and that's what I'm going to uh, talk about today is our work on um, working toward a therapy for Huntington's disease and specifically juvenile Huntington's disease um, by using the uh, MSCs or other platforms to uh, carry gene editing uh, cargo into the brain. Ambitious. So we have an amazing team working on different uh, treatment modalities for Huntington's disease, and I just wanted to point out our, our team. And this is our fearless leader, uh, Dr. Vicki Wheelock, who is the MD who treats these patients. She follows 350 families with this rare disease. They moved to the Sacramento area to be followed by her and her um, partner in the clinic, um, Terry Temkin. And we have 17 uh, children with juvenile Huntington's disease in the area, so we're very focused on that. This is a first, um, more of a low-hanging fruit uh, type um, therapy that we are proposing for, um, hunting, for adult Huntington's disease. <coughs> the gene editing team is directed by my uh, brilliant postdoc, uh, Dr. Kyle Fink, and I'm really presenting his work today because I was asked to be on the panel, and then it was, it, it was oh, can you show some slides? It's like, oh, okay, I'll show Kyle's work. But he's really um, doing some really great stuff with his team, and again, these, these young people, they know this backwards and forwards, and um, we, we uh, PIs are, are learning it, I would say. <laughs> so he has, um, we have different funding for this team, and we uh, thank all of those uh, donors. It's mostly through donors and fellowships right now. Now the Huntington's gene is an attractive target. Um, there are CAG repeats, so the normal number, um, under 31 CAG repeats, a gray area, 32 to 38. Huntington's disease occurs if they're over uh, 38, <coughs> excuse me, CAG repeats in the, in the Huntington's uh, gene. And so <coughs> it makes a horrible mutant protein, excuse me, I'm so sorry, <coughs> makes a horrible uh, mutant protein that really um, clogs the cells, causes these inclusions that kill the neurons and causes um, stridal loss, stridal neuron loss in late HD. Here's a healthy stridum and there is the, uh, the Huntington's uh, stridum. So we're trying to do something about this. So the triplet repeats causing HD and juvenile HD need to be cut out through gene editing technology down to a normal size or the resulting mutant RNA and protein need to be silenced. So one of those two strategies to make an impact upon this uh, deadly neurological disease. It's um, always fatal and we have no other treatments. So this, um, Working on this is, uh, works beautifully in a dish. We can add, we can add the gene editing, um, whatever, whatever we like. We're, we're working with the talons right now because the uh, smaller CRISPRs weren't available when we started this. Um, but whatever we add in the dish, it's really uh, working great as I'm going to uh, show you uh, the techniques in a moment. But um, how, to, how to get this into the brain and how is it going to work in the brain? So challenges for treating these single gene disorders in the CNS through gene editing um, really comes down to delivery at this point. Amazing tools, um, amazing uh, accuracy, fewer off-target effects, but how are we going to get it into the site where it's needed in the, in the patient or uh, in the animal model? And so how, how do we get these gene editing molecules into enough neurons or neural progenitors to have an impact in vivo? Will there be selective survival of corrected neural progenitors? Um, the methods that we're considering and comparing, uh, AAV, adeno-associated vector, uh, AAV9 in particular can really um, carry things, uh, but it, it's not gonna be able to make these guide RNAs, so it's not gonna be perfect for this. Uh, nanoparticles could encapsulate them, take them in for a one-time administration into the neurons, and then whatever would get into the neurons would, uh, would be in there together, as the, I call it the cargo because it's the protein and the RNA and the guide RNA. Um, we can just um, correct the iPSCs ex vivo and then transplant those, and those might have an effect in Huntington's or other uh, CNS diseases. And then what we're um, hoping to do is to use these MSC-mediated exosomes or microparticles encapsulating the gene editing cargo. And so 
<coughs> we are choosing MSCs because they have several um, just innate um, effects that they do on their own, just innate talents, I will say. And uh, I come to appreciate these talents more and more every day as I've worked with these cells for uh, almost 30 years. So they do secrete neurotrophic factors, they reduce inflammation, reduce programmed cell death, enhance connections between the neurons, and they um, reduce cell toxicity. So they're already a good candidate for um, treating Huntington's disease. They can be readily engineered using viral vectors to robustly deliver uh, cargo, uh, so for the gene silencing, for instance, remain in the brain for about one to two months, and they migrate as they do this, so they can contact a lot of neurons. They do not require immunosuppression between humans. They have a very strong safety profile in human clinical trials, and there is demonstrated delivery of intracellular contents to neurons and other cells. So um, they can be very easily genetically engineered or uh, loaded with this cargo. <coughs> and delivery can be through um, secretion of these microparticles or direct transfer via tunneling nanotubules. Um, they do secrete the exosomes or microparticles. And factors then normally confined to the cytoplasm can be transferred to the target cells. And so we do uh, have a patent on this for um, RNA inhibition. Okay, so these are human uh, MSCs moving around in the dish, communicating with one another. You can see they've formed a nanotubule here, and you can see these little dots transferring between it. Those are the mitochondria uh, going from one cell to the other. So there is cell-to-cell -cell transfer of organelles. Uh, right in this area, the cell will release a whole bunch of microparticles that then get snapped up by the other cell. So you can see right here, all of those microparticles are coming along and then the other cell comes and ingests them, gets extra factors, ATP and uh, mitochondria, and then divides and then goes on about its business. So th these cells are very good at um, talking to other cells, transferring things into other cells, and if we load them up and send them into a tissue, they can um, do this in vivo and scatter their contents um, through the trail that they've gone through or um, into the other damaged tissue. And we have, um, we are doing extensive studies in the brain with our uh, other Huntington's work. Here are human uh, MSCs labeled in red. This is a tomato red and then uh, myoblasts in green and showing their uh, communication with each other. This video is taken on the bio station, so one um, frame every 30 seconds. And you can see that they really do move around quite a bit. They leave a lot of um, particles, we call them care packages, for the other cells to take. And uh, a lot of cell-to-cell a lot -cell transfer going on. This uh, particular video is in, oh, it's not showing up very well there. Um, this particular video is in uh, online now in uh, human gene therapy methods, just accept it. So, um, silencing gene knockdown. Um, we can use cell and gene therapy to deliver genes that would uh, shut down the production of or destroy the mutant HCT RNA estriatal neurons and that could prevent the devastating mutant protein from being produced in the neurons and this is particularly important in uh, rapidly progressing uh, juvenile HD. And this one is just uh, showing some more cell-to-cell -cell communication and I don't think it's loaded. No, nope, not going to play. So uh, this one shows the uh, green loaded MSCs chasing this damaged neuron and starting to uh, send the uh, particles down into the neuron. And so we've um, we've loaded, we've engineered the MSCs to make um, RNA in inhibition uh, short strands of RNA, and then send them into these uh, Huntington's disease affected neuronal cells for reduction of the Huntington RNA and protein. We could get a significant um, reduction in the, um, in the, uh, the, uh, sorry, in the uh, mutant HCT protein. This is through direct co-culture in the dish. We're now looking at this in animal models of juvenile HD. But gene editing is what we're really all here to talk about. So moving forward from the gene silencing, which is it's easy to engineer the MSCs to do that through lentiviral vector, which stably integrates into their genome, and they then are making tons of the, um, of the silencing mRNA that they're sending out in these packages, these care packages, into the neurons. But we really want to use this platform for gene editing. So this is um, Kyle. 
He's our, our uh, leader of the gene editing team. This is all his work, along with uh, Peter Deng, his, uh, uh, the grad student that works for both of us, works with both of us and uh, the other students on his team. A uh, really brilliant team. We're assisted by uh, Dave Siegel, who works on uh, molecular therapy for Angelman syndrome and other monogenic uh, neurologic disorders at our Mind Institute at UC Davis. And so, using the towels, um, either with uh, nuclease uh, for a double strand break and deletion uh, to turn on or enhance gene expression and then finally to uh, block gene expression. And the first thing that uh, they are trying to do is to get a CAG collapse. So to try to um, get fewer CAGs until there's finally uh, steric hindrance between these so that it's a normal size. Um, it would be theoretically a 16 a CAG and no more cuts could happen. Uh, there is mutant allele silencing that they are working on with the crab domain uh, to stop the expression. And so uh, the MSCs <coughs> are good at, uh, being, at expressing these uh, gene editing proteins uh, tagged with the M-cherry label and we re can recover them, uh, identify them in the cells. And moving forward with that, it's um, Kyle's work and hopefully uh, will be published soon. We've had uh, several abstracts on this presented at a uh, neurological uh, society um, meetings. And we also have our exosome team uh, led by uh, Jonathan Anderson and his uh, wonderful team. And this is in uh, collaboration with the Karolinska Institute. And we have a paper uh, currently embargoed but uh, coming out in stem cells uh, very soon. Um, discussing the contents of these exosomes that the mesenchymal stem cells make and their, um, what they can do. So just uh, back down to the question, um, delivery, delivery, delivery. Um, how do we get it into the, into the tissues that we want? And I think that's really the overriding question. So once, once we figure all of this out, um, our, our work would apply for other uh, trinucle trinucleotide repeat diseases. And there are um, quite a few of these uh, triplet repeat disorders. and so. We are uh, forging ahead, it's really interesting. And we have a, a big um, Huntington's disease team at UC Davis and uh, international collaborators. And just really want to thank, uh, especially the Huntington's disease patient advocates, uh, patients and families that work with us uh, moving toward our, our first uh, planned clinical trial for MSC making brain drug neurotrophic factor. This really takes a village, a lot of uh, teamwork. We have a lot of cores and um, do IND enabling studies for a lot of different academic and industry partners. Just, I, I love going into work every day and seeing what these bright young students have come up with and gene editing is, is one of them. So uh, that's it and thank you for inviting me. Yes, good. In vit that's a good question. In vitro, um, as I understand it, it it's about 20%, um, but we're, we're always trying to improve that. So, and this is with the, the loading and transfer. Okay. Uh, On to the additional next. questions out there? I was, I was just wondering if you come up uh, against the ethical issues of, uh, of gene editing and, and if it's a, say, a juvenile Huntington's. I mean, is that question coming up these days uh, in the, your uh, research and uh, your institute? Um, you know, we, we talk about it a lot. Um, that would be, I think the question is for when um, the, the gene editing um, molecules are being delivered IV, there could be, trans, you know, editing or transection of the sperm or eggs, and that is, that is what FDA always worries about is the sperm or eggs being gene modified if we put any vector into any patient, and so that's their main concern. And again with this, um, that's the question that we get. Delivering them um, directly into the um, central nervous system as we are doing that reduces, although doesn't completely eliminate the, the worry about that. Mm -hmm. So, but should, should we cure kids with juvenile Huntington's disease? I think everybody's pretty much on the same side of fence is that with that, it's a terrible, terrible disease. So. Okay. Uh, and not going to the level of, of modity, well, modifying the at the germ level though no we're, we're not considering that just delivering into the brain trying to introduce yeah. some controversy here yeah uh, uh, maybe someday in the future but <laughs> it's because there, there's a lot of um, prenatal diagnosis PGD that's done for Huntington's disease so All right. someday <laughs>
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Colin Bishop. I'm professor at uh, uh, Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. I'd like to apologize. I don't have any slides to show you. I didn't quite realize it was you know, what the format was, but I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the way we intend to, or are, and uh, are continuing to do gene editing, um, but in uh, livestock, large animals. Um, and we're doing this in collaboration with Will Eyestone at uh, Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech. In fact, um, W Firm, our Institute of Regenerative Medicine, have um, uh, recently formed a, a joint institute of uh, uh, regenerative veterinary medicine. Um, and um, as Thomas was saying some time ago, uh, it was extremely difficult and time consuming to make modifications in um, mice and rats. It was, it was doable and uh, many, many people did it. <coughs> But it was even worse in um, large animals like pigs and cows and things like that. Um, why would you want to do it in pigs? It's because they actually uh, represent quite a good model for many human diseases, especially cardiac diseases, which aren't terribly well reflected in, um, in mouse models or, or rodent models in general. Um, but in fact, uh, gene editing uh, and uh, in, in large uh, uh, animals was restricted because even to this day in pigs and cattle um, uh, ES lines have not been developed for some reason they uh, we, we have not been able to generate um, uh, good uh, uh, ES lines from these large agricultural animals so uh, the uh, genetic changes that were made were by uh, simple transgenesis, which you don't have a lot of control over. You put a gene into a into um, a pig embryo or, or a cow or whatever you want to do, and it lands somewhere, and you get good expression or you get bad expression. It's it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, and then, of course, uh, though there came the uh, ability to actually clone animals, um, which was a, a great surprise that uh, um, Ian Wilmot showed many, wrote, rewrote the textbooks, if you like, and showed that, um, in fact, somatic cells, terminally differentiated somatic cells, if they were put into uh, a developing a nucleated egg, could actually um, uh, form uh, a live and a healthy animal. And so that opened the possibility that one could genetically manipulate fibroblasts um, and then through somatic cell nuclear transfer, actually clone a modified a pig or a cow. Um, and several years ago, I, uh, decide, I had a, a graduate student, very, uh, uh, very clever uh, girl, and with, together with Will, we decided that we would try and use the cow as a bioreactor to make um, um, biopharmaceuticals. And one of the, um, one of the uh, proteins that we're interested in is human serum albumin, which uh, right now is uh, obtained, of course, from donors, from human donors, and is in short supply in the world, actually. Um, so what we decided is that if we could knock out the, um, the uh, bovine serum albumin gene, replace it with human serum albumin gene, and also uh, put a promoter in front of the, uh, uh, the human serum albumin gene so that it would also express in the milk. We would in fact um, have a, a cow which would express human serum albumin in the blood and also in the milk from which we could derive um, a clinical product. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, Talons were um, just becoming um, the best way to do this. Um, and so we, we used talons and we uh, were able not only, what we wanted of course to do was not only just mutate a gene and inactivate it, what we wanted to do was use uh, gene editing or these talons to make a double strand break which vastly increases the efficiency of a homologous re recombination. So we made the double strand break in the exact place that we wanted in the uh, bovine gene, and we were able to introduce a 10 KB piece of DNA 
uh, which, in, uh, which we had um, engineered to uh, contain uh, um, a human serum albumin mini gene and some promoters and stuff. And uh, we have done that, and, uh, and then we ran out of money. So we have these, these things engineered and ready to do somatic cell nuclear transfer. Then, of course, CRISPRs <coughs> became available, and they are so much more efficient, so much easier to make. I'm not sure that I wouldn't um, even not use the lines that I've got now, but make new ones, um, even better ones and faster. Uh, through um, uh, the use of CRISPRs. The, also, um, we have been uh, making uh, models or beginning to make models of human diseases, uh, of immunodeficiency diseases, which is simply a way of um, all we had to do was knock out uh, in the first instance a single immunodeficiency gene. And instead of going through fibroblasts, gene editing them in the fibroblasts, and going through somatic cell nuclear transfer. In fact, you can inject the CRISPRs directly into the one cell egg. And we got uh, approximately, uh, if I remember correctly, around about 60% um, uh, monoallelic mono hits, and about 20% 20, 20 biallelic hits, uh, which is absolutely phenomenal and I'm sure uh, with more practice etc it will get even better and our final um, thing that we're actually involved in right now is um, uh, trying to <laughs> this this perhaps will touch on the controversy that, y that you'd like to introduce here <coughs> and uh, I've worked in regenerative uh, medicine and in particular reproductive biology for many years and uh, particularly in uh, male uh, infertility and so Will and I uh, decided that we would see um, if it was possible to regenerate the germline from an infertile person. Many people uh, present at the clinic with uh, male infertility and um, with the sequencing of the genome now, which is coming down to much, not much more than a thousand dollars, and of course exome sequencing and so on, more and more um, patients, the actual mutation which is causing their infertility is being discovered. There are patients with uh, mutations in uh, meiosis genes like SYCP3. There are patients with uh, deletions of genes on the Y chromosome and so on. And most of these deletions, um, they don't, uh, they lead to a lack of uh, spermatogenesis, but they actually leave the stem cell, the spermatogonial stem cell pool intact. So we, our uh, hypothesis is that if we could take um, stem cells uh, from infertile men, um, then uh, correct that mutation by using a, perhaps it, if there was a simple mutation, we could easily correct it with a, a long oligo, and then expand those stem cells and clone them. And th this is the important part if you were ever to use it in human. You could actually clone those stem cells, and you could, if you wanted to, you could in sequence the entire genome to make sure that you hadn't got any off-target hits or you had rearranged some of the chromosomes or there was something awful going on. <coughs> of course, we're not about to do that in the human now, so we decided to make a pig model. So we, knock, we, are in the, we haven't finished this yet, but we are proposing to um, knock out the uh, Vasa gene which leads to infertility in mice, and we also know it leads to infertility in several other animals. It's a very highly conserved gene. Once we have that model, we're going to take the um, spermatogonial stem cells, which are still there, expand them, fix them, and put them back into the same infertile pig. And hopefully, uh, our uh, hypothesis will be that we'll be able to regenerate the um, the germ cell stem uh, the germ cell line, um, and uh, of course, this is one. Um, this is this has to be done through using 
spermatogonial stem cells. It couldn't be done any other way with any sort of other gene corrections. You could think of perhaps injecting CRISPRs into the guy's testes and maybe fixing a small deletion or something, but you'd have absolutely no control over it. You wouldn't know what you were doing or how many sperm had been uh, repaired correctly. It would really not be possible. So we're doing it in uh, animal models. Um, and, and I think I'll leave it there. We are doing some other things actually in animal models. Um, uh, but one thing that um, I would throw out there for discussion is that I'm in regenerative medicine and many of my colleagues, and I'm sure a lot of you here, are um, trying to make uh, um, artificial pancreases, or pancreata, um, kidneys, livers, hearts that can be put back into people which suffer damage of those organs. But for many years now, there's been uh, several companies, it's changed hands many times, that have said, uh, we'd like to be able to do a zener transplantation from pigs into, uh, into humans, because the pig organs are pretty much like ours. And it's been slow going, they've knocked out one gene here, and uh, they've knocked out the hyperacute genes there, and it's been incredibly slow. And of course, the big problem is all the endogenous retroviruses, the porcine ones in there. But in the last year, I think George Church up in Harvard has managed with um, using CRISPRs to knock out 60, that's six zero genes. So he has a pig running around now with 60 gene knockouts, and that took him one year to do. There are more genes that need to be knocked out, but I wouldn't be, I mean, I would sort of put my money on in five or 10 years, if you need a heart transplant or a kidney, it might just come from a genetically engineered or CRISPR engineered pig. And um, I guess we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Might be that that uh, pig actually grows a human pancreas too, <laughs> right? Uh, well, uh, if NIH that comes up with that, the that's been for done that. in um, China. Right, they've in made Japanese pig group. human. Mm -hmm. it, w it Japan, Japan was it? Japanese group. They've made group. the hybrids, correct? Yeah. Right. right. Good. Okay. Uh, questions for Colin? Anyone? Right. So there was a, it was a show of hands at about, I think a, just roughly about at least half of you were saying that you'd really like to do gene editing. Um, you know, what, is, what are the barriers out there? And, and the panelists can uh, chime in as well. Where, where, why aren't we doing more of it? Is it uh, the cost? Is it the expertise? What, uh, what's, what are the barriers to gene editing? Toxicity and off-target effects. Yeah. Uh, in in a particular uh, application, or uh, or is it? In general, but for in vivo delivery, that's what you're worried about, right? Okay, for an in vivo delivery type of system. Jan, did you want to address that? At all? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's a worry, but uh, there are improvements made in these systems all the time, and uh, people are making better and better and more and more um, specific ones, and with any therapy, you're um, weighing risk to benefit ratio, so I think it really does depend on what you're trying to treat, um, how nasty is the disease versus are you just trying to modify something mm. that might make someone's life a little easier. So that's just my take on it. Thomas, you were saying it's very inexpensive to do these once you've got the the uh, sets put together. Uh, tell us a ballpark figure if you wanted to try to do this in a, in a particular cells. I mean, what, what, how, how expensive are those? Well, I, uh, as PI, I didn't notice this actually on the budget, so it's just probably a very <laughs> minor. That's very telling, though. <laughs> right. I, I don't know, it's, it's a plasmid and, and, and the components are really nothing in comparison. A couple to of hundred dollars yeah. when you got the plasmid. It's an expensive PCR basically, that's what it is. And 
and the and the barriers for for animal modification are really more on the embryo side than um, uh, the barriers. Yeah, uh, of course, it's relatively simple to um, do any cell line um, that you, you know you want to modify. It's also relatively simple, <laughs> even simpler in, in a sense, just to inject it into the embryo and right. let the animals be born. But when you're dealing with pigs or cows, you need the whole agricultural setup. Um, it's it's uh, it's expensive business. Yeah. And um, it's not for the faint-hearted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's several <laughs> groups out there that would suggest there are many. Don't need, you don't even need nuclear transfer or cloning no, anymore. No, you don't need just, that anymore. You just inject it depends what you want to do. Embryos. If you want to put a big piece of DNA in, you probably I I don't know. I don't know how efficient that would be by simple injection into the embryo mm -hmm. because you're asking not only to make the double strand break but then you're asking for um, the uh, piece of DNA to go in there and uh, probably a piece of a you know a few hundred base pairs is nothing but if you're trying to put something of five or six or seven eight maybe ten KB in it's going to be a lot more difficult. And I think that brings up the, the topic of whether you knock out or knock in, what's, what's easier, what's, uh, you know, wh where, where are the pitfalls in, in that area? Well, it's always easier just to knock it out. <laughs> I was asked a similar question in the, in the first panel I was in today, and um, we, we work, of course, a lot with the Huntington's patients advocates and others. And um, I mean, in the United States, we are dictated by in what we can do by the FDA. We have to be compliant with the FDA. So it's important for the patient advocates to not beg us scientists to do it, but to to let the FDA know what what they accept as a, as a risk versus benefit ratio and then it can be considered. Um, you know, the science has to be there, it has to be strong, it has to be efficacious and we have to show safety. So that that is on, you know, the patient advocates, it's important for them to get scientists interested, but the FDA is the final, it has the final say, we can't do it no matter how much the patients want it if it's not FDA approved. And um, I think what the patient advocates can do most is to help us get funding and do fundraising events because without the funding, none of this gets done, none of it even gets started. So that's, that's the really important thing. But are you talking about treating children with SMA or sort of um, correcting it in the embryo? No, I'm talking about treating children. Okay. Because there is this um, pre implantation genetic diagnosis around. Um, which, uh, you know, if the parents have it and they got a 25 or 50 percent chance, depending on the on the genetics of it, um, you can choose which one you want to implant. So, and that's going on all the time. But of course, you know, treating children that have it is good. We, we were having a discussion about that at dinner last night, um, specifically again for Huntington's. Um, there is that, but it's not paid for by insurance or mm -hmm. by the government. So that's a, that's another important discussion. But it wouldn't it wouldn't modify the genome, would it? I mean, so their children yeah. would also have a fifty percent chance. It's dominant, right, Huntington's? Oh, Huntington's is yeah, the, it's dominant. So, yeah. um, it, but if you choose the if you choose the embryo to implant that did not get the expanded allele, right, then it would not be passed further. But yeah. it's very expensive. I mean, the families were, are already strapped. If you were strapped. if you were treating it in the brain, you wouldn't be. Oh, treating it in the, the brain, yeah, it would not do anything to the brain. So, no. it's just it would just help the patients who are yeah. already suffering from it. So, Jan, is is Huntington's going to be the first one that's going to be cured? With oh, somebody? I doubt it because again, it all comes down to funding. So, unless unless some amazing philanthropist appears and helps us get there. Huntington's will not be the first one, but we, we are steadily proceeding. Do you, do you have uh, some thoughts? I'll put you on the spot here on what, what will be the first. I think in probably um, diseases of the eye because it's more contained and it's less scary to people than modifying the brain. Um, there tends to be a major reaction to modifying the brain and spinal cord. Um, but the, the eye is more contained and a lot of things have been pioneered in the eyes. We have a great eye group too that's doing some pretty mm -hmm. cool stuff. So. 
Yeah. You, you can do something. You can see it. Yeah. Or you do something 